Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for braving the snow to come to CSIS for this morning's event. I want to welcome you here and uh, also welcome our online audience uh, watching via the web. Uh, we are glad everyone was able to tune in with us. We're really excited to uh, show you the results of some, uh, some work that we've done on the defense industry, uh, particularly on new entrants. Uh, and the success of small business in the defense industry. And uh, we're very excited to make those, uh, make those findings public. Uh, I want to start, as we always do here at CSIS, with our security announcement, which is to say, um, if we get a chance to make snow angels this morning, because we have to leave this room for some reason together, I'll be your security officer and, uh, and escort you outside, either the way you came in or out the back. Uh, but we don't anticipate that happening. Uh, I also want to make sure to acknowledge, recognize, and thank the Naval Postgraduate School because the study uh, that produced this report, the, act, the, the work that led to this report, uh, was sponsored by a grant from the Naval Postgraduate School, and we're very, very grateful uh, for that support. Um, we have an all-star panel also that's going to uh, really dig into these, the meat of these issues uh, after the uh, study findings are presented by Samantha. Um, let me just touch briefly before turning it over to Samantha to, to start with, uh, with our findings um, before you hear from our other experts on why we think uh, new entrants and small business graduation matter. And as you know, uh, the group that you're hearing from today, the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group, by the nature of our very name, we kind of give it away that uh, we are very much focused on the health of the defense industrial base and trying to understand um, what trends are happening in industry and how they impact on military mission, how they impact on uh, the success of the Department of Defense in, in support of U.S. national security. Um, and there's a lot that goes into that, but um, the question of whether the defense industrial base is capable of delivering what the nation needs uh, and is going to remain capable of delivering what the nation needs in a very, very challenging security and complex security environment is a really significant one, and perhaps one where we are less sure of our answer today than we have been for decades. Um, and that's because we have more serious competition now than we've seen for, um, I would say, at least three decades, uh, and, and are being challenged in ways we really haven't been challenged in a long time. In fact, uh, some people have argued that we're being challenged in a way that we haven't been challenged uh, in centuries. Um, and that's partly because we're dealing with economic competitors who are larger uh, and more successful than any the U.S. has faced in a, in a very long time. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot that goes into the question of whether defense industry can deliver what we need. The executive branch uh, did a very detailed industrial base review, and we have the person who helped lead that here as one of our panelists today. Uh, and they identified a number of issues, um, and those are... Uh, really significant issues. I don't know the details of all of them because there's a lot of classified information in that and I no longer have access to that. But, uh, but there's a lot of issues identified. I think there's also bigger picture issues about uh, whether the next generation of emerging technologies are ones that the U.S. is positioned to, to lead on. Um, and I think that's what makes this subject matter so important. Um, whether we can get the kind of innovative new firms uh, that are likely to be key leaders in these emerging technologies to participate in the defense industrial base, to stay in the defense industrial base, uh, to find it uh, to their interests to be part of the defense industrial base, and whether the critical small firms that uh, make up a large portion of these new entrants uh, are, are experiencing success in defense industry, and are they, uh, do they have the path forward uh, in their corporate uh, history uh, that we hope they do. So without any further uh, ado from me, I'm going to welcome Samantha to the stage to brief you on our findings. Uh, and after that, we'll move into our panel discussion. And we will have audience questions as part of the panel discussion. Samantha. Thank you, Andrew, um, and thanks everyone for joining us today despite the weather. So um, I'm going to run you through kind of the top level findings of the report. And if you didn't get a copy on the way in, it's available via the web. And I apologize in advance, some of these uh, numbers are hard to read from the audience perspective, but the slides will also be on the web after the event. Um, so I'd also just like to start with thanking my co-authors, Andrew, um, Gregory Sanders, Samuel Mooney, and Mariel Roth. Um, so with this project, we wanted to examine the pool of new vendors contracting with the federal government 
over time. And we did this by looking at the general trends of new entrances and exits in the federal marketplace, seeing how many new vendors were still working with the federal government after 10 years, and calculating how many of the new vendors survived and how many of the um, small new vendors grew from their small business status post-entry. So I'll plan to start with giving you a brief project scope and background, um, then I'll go through some of the trends, then I'll go through some of the results, and then give you a couple big takeaways. Um, so for the project background and scope, uh, there are a lot of various issues associated with non-traditional vendors and small business policies, but um, we posed these four general questions at the beginning of the research to kind of guide what we were looking at. So we first asked, what are their survival rates for new entrants in the federal marketplace? How do these survival rates compare with the survival rates for new entrants in the defense industrial base specifically? How do these survival rates change between small and non-small businesses? And what are the graduation rates for small business new entrants in the federal contracting market? And the data that we used to support the analyses came the, from the federal procurement data system, which I'll refer to as FPDS um, for the remainder of the presentation. And we created a longitudinal data set with information at the firm level describing their characteristics, their contracts, and their entrances and exits in the federal marketplace on an annual basis from 2001 to 2016. So I'll start with um, describing um, as I go along the variables and methodology. So here we have the number of new entrants and the number of incumbent vendors during each year of our observation period. And uh, we define new entrants by calculating the first sign date of a contract in FPDS for a vendor identified by their individual DUNS number over all of the years available in CSIS's data. So uh, our version of the contract database begins in 2000 for federal agencies other than DOD, and using some other sources, uh, we've been able to expend, extend the database about a decade earlier for DOD specifically. Thus, it is possible that we have um, defined a new entrant that had actually contracted with the government before our uh, available data, but our goal for defining new entrants was to capture those vendors that had not uh, worked with the government prior to um, our observation period. So this can capture new starting organizations, new work sites for existing organizations, and also long established organizations making their first foray into federal contracting. And incumbent firms are defined as all firms contracting with the government in a given year that have contracted with the government before. So kind of one of the big takeaways from the slide is that in general, and oftentimes, less than half and oftentimes less than a quarter of all the federal vendors are new entrants in, the, in each year. And as you can see, there's a significant long-term decline for both all um, agencies and DOD. Um, and then one other thing to know is that the threshold for reporting in FPDS went from $25,000 to $2,500 in 2004, which could be contributing to the sharp increase at the beginning of the observation period. So here we have the amount of obligations going to new entrants and the amount of obligations going to incumbent firms in each year. And we define obligations as the dollar amount that the government owes to a firm for all contracts that a firm has over the entire observation period from 2001 to 2016. Um, and new entrants are represented in the year that they entered and incumbent firms are represented in each year that they had an active contract with the government. So one of the big takeaways from this graphic is that incumbent firms have the vast majority of obligations compared to new entrants over the observation period. Um, and also you can see that obligations kind of tail off towards the end of the period, which aligns with the time of sequestration. So here we have um, the number of new entrants in each year, and we break that out between small new entrants and non-small new entrances. And we define small using the Small Business Administration's definitions of small and non-small vendors. Um, and these definitions consider differences across all sectors of the economy. And therefore, each sector has its own threshold for whether a firm is small. And that can depend on revenue, um, employee size, or a combination of those two factors. And um, if a firm is not small, then we consider it non-small, but that could be medium or large. So one of the big takeaways here is that uh, there's an alarming drop-off of new entrants after 2005 and a bottoming out of this trend in 2013 and not much growth since then. 
Um, the number of new vendors entering the federal contracting market in 2016 was 70% lower than the number entering in the highest year, 2005. And for the defense industrial base um, in 2016, the number entering was 75% lower than its highest point in 2005. Um, and you can also see that the majority of these new vendors are small businesses. So here you can see the obligations for small and non-small new vendors. Um, and one important observation to note here is that small new entrants contracting with DOD have lower shares of obligations um, compared with the, large, the medium and large ones than small new entrants contracting across all federal agencies. And if you think about this coupled with the last slide, um, the number of small new vendors heavily outweighs the number of non-small in the sample, but it's interesting to see that the obligations are um, mainly going to the non-small vendors. So here we have uh, the averages of the survival rates and graduation rates that we calculated for six different samples of the new entrants during our observation period. And survival rates are calculated for five, three, five, and 10 years post-entry. And in each post-entry year examined, the survival rate is equal to the number of firms that survive in that year divided by the number of firms that entered in the baseline year. And graduation rates are calculated for small new vendors that were small in the baseline year and survived 10 years. Um, and we consider small business graduation to occur through either organic firm growth or acquisition by a larger company. And we calculate the graduation um, by dividing the number of firms that graduated in the last year by the total number of small firms that entered in the baseline year. So one important result here is that um, small new entrants have survival rate, higher survival rates than non-small competitors for all federal agencies uh, with statistically significant differences between the two groups. But when contracting with the Defense Department, non-small new entrants have higher survival rates than their small competitors. Um, and we were thinking that this could be a result of the high regulatory barriers to entry coupled with the concentrated defense in weapons industry that um, sometimes makes duty contracting less accessible for the small businesses. And additionally, um, the results across all federal agencies where the small new vendors survive at higher rates than the non-small new vendors is pretty notable because um, in the wider academic literature that studies this issue with respect to the general economy and not federal procurement, it's widely accepted that um, large new vendors do much better than the small new vendors. So the fact that in, with the federal marketplace, the small new vendors are surviving um, at higher rates than the non-small could indicate that the small business policies are succeeding in helping out those small businesses um, when they're contracting with the federal government. Um, and another key takeaway here are the low graduation rates, which I'll speak to more in the next slide. Um, so if there's nothing else, I'd like you to walk away um, thinking about this report. It's uh, that firstly, the federal government and DOD uh, seem to be becoming less successful over time at attracting and retaining new vendors. Um, secondly, the relatively higher rate of survival for small businesses compared to their non-small competitors for all federal agencies. Um, suggests that the small business policies are succeeding in their goals to create a healthy federal marketplace. Um, however, that's kind of coupled with uh, our last point that the low rate of graduation for small businesses could indicate that small business policies also carry some perverse incentives that dissuade small vendors from growing past small business status. And um, you could argue that some vendors want to stay small, but uh, generally you would think that success for businesses is growing or being acquired by a larger firm. And with that, I'll hand the stage back over to Andrew and our panelists. So I'll ask the panel to join me up here. Well, thank you very much, Samantha, uh, both for your work on the study and for that presentation. Uh, and I'm really excited to get this panel together um, to explore this issue because I think we have exactly the perspectives we need uh, to dig into this deeper and understand the significance of it. And so I'm going to introduce the panel and then I'll give everyone um, an opportunity to kind of dig in on their initial thoughts um, before we kind of break the issue down. 
Uh, to my right is Emily Harmon. She is director of the Office of Small Business Programs uh, at the Department of the Navy. Uh, she's responsible for small business acquisition policy and strategic initiatives for the Department of the Navy and chief advisor to the Secretary of the Navy on small business matters. She's a member of the Senior Executive Service with uh, a long history of federal service, including at NAVAIR um, uh, in several capacities. Um, so thank you very much, Emily, thank for joining you. us. Uh, to her right is Brennan Grignon, who is the Director of Policy Industry uh, Outreach for the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. Uh, she leads all industry engagement for acquisition and sustainment and facilitates uh, consistent strategic dialogue between DOD and the industrial base. Uh, she was uh, leading or helped lead the interagency response uh, to the Executive Order 13806, which was the uh, industrial base review. Uh, and, uh, as, and that review assessed the health of the industrial base and had many uh, interesting and significant findings about areas of concern in the industrial base. Prior to her government service, she was at the private sector and as an analyst and a researcher uh, at, uh, at Lockton Companies and at LMI. To her right is uh, Chris Bros who is currently the head of strategy at Anderil Industries. Um, he's responsible for prioritizing business invest investments and positioning Anderil to build innovative technologies for critical defense issues. Anderil is a new entrant into the defense industry, so we're excited about that and definitely excited to have that perspective. Uh, Chris is, um, I would say, at least a triple threat. Uh, in this discussion, because in addition to being someone who can speak to the perspectives of a new entrance and defense industry, as, as most of our audience, I'm sure, knows, he is the former staff director of the Senate Armed Services Committee um, and uh, national security advisor to the late Senator John McCain. Uh, he was also, prior to that, uh, at the State Department and uh, as an advisor to Secretaries of State Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. And to his right is Tara Murphy Doherty, who is president of the National Security Practice at Goini, where she leads strategy and growth in the federal government marketplace. Um, she's also a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and most importantly, a non-resident senior associate here at CSIS. Um, uh, prior to uh, her time at Govini, she also led business development at Palantir Technologies, another new entrant in the defense industry, uh, and prior to that, chief of staff of Global Strategic Affairs and the Office of Secretary of Defense. So she has a government perspective, a new entrant perspective, and the perspective of someone who studies uh, the defense industry and the federal contracting industry. So thank you very much. Uh, and Emily, I'd ask you to start. And, and for the initial round, I would like folks maybe just to give their, their top level thoughts. Um, if you want to react to our study findings, we would love that. Uh, but there may also be things that you think are more significant that the study didn't address that may be more critical to understanding what's happening with new entrants and why they're important in the defense industry and, and also with small business issues. So Emily, why don't you start? Okay. Samantha, happy to be here. Um, a couple things that I think about are, um, and we, we look at this data as well for the Department of the Navy, and the Department of the Navy consists of the Navy and Marine Corps, so we try to analyze the FPDSNG data and look at what it's telling us with respect to new entrants coming in to support the Navy and the Marine Corps as prime contractors. This is all as prime contractors. We don't have as much visibility into the, into the subcontracting. And one of the challenges is just with the FPDSNG data. I think we switched over to a new system in 2010, so, you know, we only can, you know, use the data that we have, so wonder how accurate it is, but um, uh, that's something that to, to think about. But I think in order, to, we are definitely looking for new entrants to come in and support the Navy and the Marine Corps because it instills competition, it brings in new ideas. You know, if you just sit with the, st stay with the status quo, that's not good. Um, and we have new challenges. Um, so one of the ways to do that is better communication with industry, and I think we have a, um, a little bit of a risk-adverse environment where we're, you know, some people in the acquisition workforce are a little concerned about what they can say to industry, when they should communicate to industry, and I think we need to be um, communicating maybe in different ways. I think that some of the companies that we're looking for to do business with us, they're probably not looking at Fed biz ops. You know, when we announce on Fed biz ops, we're probably missing a lot of the non-traditional suppliers, a lot of the non-traditional companies. So I think we need to also look at that. 
look at new ways of communicating. The Office of Small Business Programs for the Department of the Navy just set up a LinkedIn page about a couple of weeks ago, and we have um, just under 1,000 followers. I think it might be 800 um, the other day. So that's one way that we're trying to communicate more. We also have a Facebook site and a Twitter site and a YouTube channel. And we've been starting to do Facebook Lives. So coming up on February 7th, we have a Facebook Live session with Elliot Branch, who's the head of contracts for the Navy and Marine Corps, and Tom Frankfurt, who's one of our, um, who's Secretary Gertz's chief attorney. And we're gonna be talking just about that, about communication with industry, also about the rulemaking process. So I think Congress is doing some good things to try to improve the acquisition environment, but sometimes it takes a long time for those to get into law. So one of the things um, in your study was, you know, about the challenge of the mid-tier um, companies that aren't small, but they're, um, not, they're not really large either. They're kind of in the medium realm. So the Congress just passed a law, I think it was called the Runway Extension Act, which allowed the companies to count the last five years of their annual revenue instead of the last three. But we're still using the three because that's not you know, it's in law, but it's not in the regulations yet. So taking a look at how long it takes for the laws that Congress has passed, passes to get into regulation is something that impacts, I think, the, the, the new entrants as well. So those are just a couple of things that I'd point out. Communication with industry, communicating in different ways to try to reach these non-traditional companies, taking a look at the outreach events we go to and seeing if maybe um, we need to, to to uh, change that up a little bit too. Are we just going to an event because we went to it last year? Um, and um, communicating about the benefits that these small businesses are bringing to us and not talking about small business in terms of meeting a goal, but talking about it more in terms of, you know, helping us achieve a strategic advantage that we need to achieve and utilizing these innovative companies, I think is important too. So that's my opinion. Thank you, Emily. Brenna. Yeah, so thank you, um, Andrew, for having me here again, and to Samantha for leading the study. Uh, so as Andrew mentioned, so I'm the director of uh, industrial policy within the uh, ANS organization. So our office, industrial policy, actually now houses the small business programs from an OSD perspective which I think as part of the reorganization is very beneficial because now we can do holistic industry outreach from small, medium, and prime contractors. And oftentimes there is a perception that um, under Secretary Lord or prior to her under Secretary Kendall's engagement with industry has been primarily with the traditional primes like Lockheed and Northrop, et cetera. And, and it is a misperception, I can tell you for a fact, as the person who is in charge of that industry engagement, that we spend a lot of time with small and medium-sized companies. We utilize organizations like the trade associations, many of whom have small business divisions to do outreach to those companies. Um, and one of the big pushes that Ms. Lord has had through her acquisition reforms is, is how do we do better acquisition, more agile acquisition, especially to small and medium-sized companies so that we are a better business partner within the defense industrial base. Um, so a lot of the findings from this report uh, are resonant to the findings that we had in the 13806 report. And if you are familiar with that, we talked about five macro forces that drive risk into the industrial base so that create these single and sole source foreign dependency issues. And one of the macro forces that we identified and talked about was U.S. government business practices. So there is a recognition that we did a hard look in the mirror and we said, sometimes we are our own worst enemy when it comes to this space. So how do we do better industrial policy and acquisition practice so that we can make a healthy and robust and secure industrial base, which is what our office's mission is all about. And part of that is to keep small businesses that are in the defense industrial base within our ecosystem and also to help them graduate. Now sometimes, to Emily's point, we might a small business may want to stay a small business. I have a contact who's got a 10-person job shop, and he has no intention of really becoming any larger than 10 or 15 people. There's a lot of different reasons why companies want to stay small, and that's great. But if they want to grow, the reason that they cannot grow shouldn't be because it's too hard to do business with the Department of Defense. So what we're looking at is from an acquisition perspective, how do we make things more seamless? How do we create more efficiency? 
And then from an outreach perspective, a lot of the outreach that we do is to the primes to make them aware of the small businesses that might be challenged in their, in, in their sub-tiers. Um, because oftentimes they actually don't know that there is risk within their supply chain. Uh, sometimes they find out years after a company has left the defense industrial base, which causes a lot of challenges from us as a customer. So we're trying to provide them with more visibility. Our office also will take a meeting with any organization that is currently doing business with the department or wants to do business. I meet with companies on a daily basis of all shapes and sizes and have those conversations about what it is that's precluding them from entering our market or what, it, what is it that's making them think about leaving our market. And the other piece of it too is to talk to the financial sector. A lot of the engagement that I do is with Wall Street because at the end of the day, if you don't have support from the investment sector and you don't have support from the investor community that looks at the defense industrial base as a viable market within the larger US economy, there is a disconnect between where the money is flowing and where we would like it to flow from a national security perspective. Um, so a lot of the engagement that we have is explaining to the investor community why the defense industrial base and why manufacturing are a core component of national security and economic security in this country and why it all helps us move forward in terms of how we face our adversaries on the battlefield and in the gray zone. So that is a lot of what we're working on in this space and I just thank CSIS again for their studies because we use them often. We talked about the sequestration study in our executive order report and so we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, happy to do it. <laughs> Chris. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me and uh, really just want to commend Andrew and Samantha and the team for some really awesome work. Um, I think this is exactly what organizations like CSI should do, bringing new data uh, into the public debate and really kind of highlighting some pretty troubling trends. And, you know, what I would say is this really, to me, is very troubling. And I think, uh, you know, people should be troubled by this. Um, you know, I think we kind of have to step back and ask the question, so, you know, why do we care about getting new entrants into the Defense Department, into the national security market? And I would say simply that I think we've all been talking for a while about a concern that, uh, advanced technology isn't getting into the hands of the warfighter fast enough, uh, the right kinds of technology, um, that traditional industry partners um, are perhaps not doing that uh, as well uh, or as extensively as the department needs. Um, so we need new entrants to come in and, and help provide that. So to me, the really compelling reason to get new entrants into the national security defense market um, is to enhance the mission. Um, to get new technology to the hands of the warfighter, um, to create a more resilient and vibrant um, and innovative industrial base. So I think uh, this is a problem. We have to ask the question, why is this a problem? Uh, it is not, in my opinion, for lack of policy. We have tons of policy that says we're trying to encourage this. I think the problem is, uh, what I would say, is the goals of those policies as they've been defined and how those policies are executed. So I think from the standpoint of goals, um, you know, we, we need to be clear in our terminology. Um, we talk about small businesses, we talk about innovative businesses. Many innovative businesses are small. Not all small businesses are innovative. Um, I am interested in getting innovative businesses into the Department of Defense. Um, I think that needs to be the top priority from the standpoint of mission. Um, I think many of the policies that we have around small businesses are focused on you know, what I would consider to be, for lack of a better term, social justice more than military advantage. Um, and social justice is fine, you know, getting more socially, economically disadvantaged companies to work with the department, that's all good. I think from the standpoint of the mission, the more important thing is getting those innovative companies in to do, uh, to do that work. You know, you see it reflected on the Hill where many of these policies are overseen by small business committees rather than armed services committees. Um, so again, I think to highlight a point that was made in the report, you know, one of the incentives that uh, unfortunately gets, I think, put into these policies is that if the goal is to do business with small businesses, then the incentive is for those small businesses to stay small businesses, because that's what we want to show. Um, then I think that sort of dovetails into the problem of execution. Um, in my experience on the Hill, and certainly in my experience now at a, an innovative small business, um, the Department of Defense likes to make large numbers of really small bets on innovative companies. Um, they want to sprinkle around small amounts of money to lots of different contractors. Um, then the added problem is that those small bets don't transition into larger bets. 
Um, so it shouldn't come as a surprise that small businesses aren't transitioning into larger businesses, that new entrants aren't surviving. Um, you know, I think the problem here is that if you want small businesses to grow, and speaking for someone who works at a small business that is eager to become a larger business, um, you have to pay them. Um, that is how they grow. That is how you go out and raise larger rounds of investment. Um, you have to align the economic incentives. Um, investors are not investing in defense because they don't think it is a good investment. And unfortunately, the data shows that that is right. Um, you need to create incentives for investors to look at companies that are doing innovative next generation defense technology work and say, I can make money betting on those kinds of companies. So the, the final thing I would leave you with in terms of what to do about all of this is I would say we have to concentrate. Um, we have to concentrate our priorities, which means uh, that from the department, they can't say, you know, here are 500 areas of research and development that we're kind of interested in providing small amounts of money into. Um, I think the uh, industrial-based study classified, I haven't read it, I would hope, uh, would identify the small numbers of technology areas that we care about more than others, um, and the willingness, hopefully, that we would be to put larger amounts of money toward the things we say we care about more than other things. So I think we have to concentrate our priorities, and then I think we have to concentrate the bets we make. I think we need to make a smaller number of larger bets. Um, and I think this ultimately comes down to, um, and this you know, may, may sound horrible, but uh, I think it's the reason we're in this, is we have to pick winners. Um, that is the idea. We have to say the things we care about more than other things, and we have to pick the winners who are providing the capabilities that are better than other things. Um, and as they are invested in and as they show success, we have to keep buying what they are providing. Um, we can't say, you know, here's $500,000, you did something really interesting, lots of luck in your senior year. Um, this is something that we have to pull through the system and say it's a priority and put real money against it. Thank you, Chris. Taryn. Great. Well, first, let me just echo um, my distinguished co-panelists by expressing my thanks to uh, Samantha and Andrew for having me here. Um, I think the report is excellent, and I'm pleased to be able to provide a few comments on it. So first, wearing all of my hats from the nonprofit sector to the private sector to the government world, the overriding view I have is um, the, the data behind this um, and the light that this excellent study sheds on the need to have better data to conduct the, these important types of analyses. Um, right at the beginning, Emily, you mentioned, and of course, Samantha, you mentioned in your overview that FPDS really gives you a snapshot and frankly, a partial snapshot at a prime obligation um, landscape with respect to the federal government. That is such a small segment when you think about a non-traditional entrant and particularly a small business um, perspective of the business environment um, and participation. And yet it's not for lack of trying. Um, the ability to put together a more comprehensive view from a data perspective is a significant feat and undertaking and frankly requires really being able to piece together the supply chain for major defense programs and other uh, federal government activities. So that is something that I think needs to be, uh, needs more attention as a first order priority in order to support the study of this issue and, and get better. And then frankly, and, um, it mirror, the difficulty that we all deal with um, in looking at the data is mirrored on the government side. The, you know, we heard from our um, government representatives here the, that you're looking at many of the same data sources. So the fractured nature of these data systems and the difficulty in looking at participation of different vendors holistically, if you're relying on a single source or um, if you have to stitch together um, in a bespoke way um, otherwise disparate systems, greatly complicates the overall study and the ability to pull together um, what I would say is the second important thing, um, the ability to measure our success. And I think this is one thing that government needs to do a lot more of. So there are obviously a tremendous number of initiatives underway to improve collaboration with small business, to attract innovative organizations to working with the government. Um, and I think the Pentagon in particular is saying all the right things about doing that. 
Um, but how often are we stepping back and measuring whether these efforts are successful? And, um, and I think that needs to take place a, a lot more often. So if, if you use the data and, and study it, um, our, my company, Gavini, did uh, some work with DOD last year where we looked at investments in artificial intelligence. And we took an industry standard list of the 100 commercial companies that are considered in the private sector to be leaders in AI. And we found that exactly two of them had contracts with DOD. So that's one issue in and of itself. But what I think is, might be more interesting is that in separate work, we had been working very closely with a number of service components and found that many of them were actually exceeding their uh, statutory requirements for set-asides. Um, so for small businesses, they were uh, awarding work at above and beyond the 23% typically required, up to 30% and over. So the point there is that the intentions are good, the efforts are underway, where the disconnect might be, and I'll pick up on what Chris was saying because my, uh, my bottom line is, is very similar, it's not just the number of small businesses, but it's the character of whom we're working with. Are we attracting the right companies, um, or are we checking a box to make sure that a designation is being met? And then the final thing I would just say is that I don't think that this issue can be divorced from overall discussions of broader acquisition reform, not in the sense that there are new reforms needed, but what is underway and a much, much needed continued cultural shift within the acquisition community, particularly with DOD. I think that's true in two regards. Um, one is with respect to the timeline from which a business decides to do work with the federal government, whether it's through responding to an RFI from FBO or its personal engagement with the customer, to the time that they are actually on contract. That cycle is so incredibly long that it just outpaces what most bi small businesses can sustain. And then even if you aren't a small business, but you are an innovative business, you have to compare that timeline to your opportunities that you might have for working with other commercial partners. And that's where those trade-offs um, take place, and I think where DOD and the federal government start to lose out. And then the second thing, I, the second aspect of this, I believe, is IP rights. This is an issue that uh, DOD is certainly grappling with but needs to make a lot more progress on and continues to be a point of friction, I believe, with particularly the, the types of companies that we want to attract on the basis of innovation. And the reason that I say it has to do with ongoing acquisition reform or efforts already underway is because in many cases the FAR actually already has all of the frameworks that are needed to create in structures, contracting structures that are advantageous to the government but also protect the, the businesses in the private sector. But what we find is that um, the acquisition community or the contracting officers tend to fall back on what they know, whether it's risk aversion or it's simply this is how we've, I've been doing it for 16 years. Um, the willingness to venture into uh, new types of data rights that distinguish between existing commercial data sets, for example, and the types of technical data that are created as an output of a weapon system, those are very, very different things and need to be treated as such. Um, so as we employ methods like OTAs, which we all hail as a wonderful um, opportunity to engage non-traditional companies or small businesses, we have to look at what practically that means. And the fact that it is often a um, very, very small uh, monetary value associated with with uh, prototyping or getting started and that the process to actually embed into a larger program that has the kind of return that a business needs in order to not just sustain but to grow um, is, is exceptionally long. Um, or something like broad agency announcements which are focused on prototyping uh, and therefore introduce risk depending on how things are structured from an intellectual property perspective um, because if 
you are working with a small company, but what they have is some amount of existing technology, there's IP already tied to that. And how do you find systems that incentivize and support the development of that technology and of that innovation in a way that keeps the IP rights in the right place so that national security equities are protected, um, but that business is protected as well. Okay, thank you, Tara. Um, well, a couple of, I think, key themes have emerged from all of your remarks that I want to briefly just sort of identify and then try to dig in on. And uh, a big one was communications, uh, outreach, communications, um, engagement. A second one was business practices as coming out of the industrial base review. And then a third one that I find really intriguing, although they're all fascinating, is uh, what I would characterize as kind of market structure um, from the perspective of if, if a, uh, to the remarks that Chris and Tara made, to the extent that we want companies to be attracted and capital to be attracted to defense industry, it seems to me that would be facilitated by being uh, having an awareness or a picture of a market, its size, and the potential for growth. So you may start with a small contract, but if you perceive that, okay, if we win that contract, we then get access to a market which may be you know, $5 billion versus the $200,000 um, one that I'm competing for, that's a different picture uh, for both industry and, and capital. Um, and then I think underpinning that market visibility is this issue of data, of how do we even know what the AI market at DOD is? How do we even know uh, what the market is? Um, and it strikes me, uh, when I think about some of the work that we've done, that one of the markets that has done relatively speaking well is shipbuilding. And one of the things about shipbuilding is you pretty much know where to go if you're looking for data about shipbuilding. You can go to the Navy and you'll find it. Now, obviously, other parts of, uh, of the DOD purchase marine-related equipment and, and things. But it's, it's a little more centralized than the vast majority of our very disaggregated system. And um, I'm reminded a little bit that when Mr. Kendall was the undersecretary, he would always say that no one in government actually has a view of all the implications of all the different things we're doing on, for example, missiles, except the big industry suppliers. Raytheon and Northrop and Lockheed have that view because they see all of that data coming in, and they have fairly robust teams who track all of that and analyze it, um, but it's pretty hard for a small business to do what the business development teams at Lockheed, Raytheon, and Northrop Grumman do to understand uh, the missile system. Um, the, the missile market. So I just kind of would ask the panel, if you could, to um, to think about number one. Do you do you kind of does that make sense to you? Does this issue of data as a as a linchpin to market access um, and and ways possibly to to solve that? You know, so we have FPDS, which has a tremendous wealth of data. I, far be it from me to trash FPDS. We couldn't do the work we do without it. It's a critical tool. It is not user-friendly, um, and in some ways that helps organizations like CSIS because we develop the ability to work with it, and then that's something we can do that not everyone can do. But uh, are there ways, and you know, Govini does this, it makes pretty highly usable information available. Are there ways we could make this data more visible to more people to attract capital, and and would that and can we use that to facilitate this this communication, engagement, and dialogue with industry so that we're kind of talking apples to apples? So, who, if anyone would volunteer, uh, Chris, and then we'll do Tara. Yeah, I'll just make a brief point. I mean, I would say there is, I think, a communications problem, but we need to focus on what that problem is. I don't think it's that small businesses, innovative businesses, new prospective entrants don't know where to find the department. Like, I think that's not it. Um, I think providing, you know, huge amounts of data on missile systems and all of this and then sort of putting the onus on them to figure out what is the most important thing that the department cares about uh, is not the communications problem. I mean, to me, the real communications problem is the willingness or ability or both of the department to say, of all of the things that I am doing, these are my biggest problems. These are the subcomponents or the systems or the emerging technologies that if someone can show me real capability, I'm gonna put real money toward that. That then is a signal to who, you know, to, to companies that are prospective uh, entrants to say, you know, that is something that I wanna go swing at. 
Um, and I think it's, uh, it's a huge signal to the investment community that the department is getting serious about what it cares about, uh, and it's going to start concentrating bets and things so that the investment community can look for those things as well with the idea that, you know, they're going to help those companies raise their next round. Because that, I mean, ultimately, you know, getting the contract is important, right? Getting a big contract is important. Um, but it's far more important for a small business in the sense that it can then turn around to the investment community and go raise, you know, a round of funding that's a 10x valuation of what they had. And that gives them years of runway to, to keep working. So, you know, it's a matter, again, I think, of aligning the incentives, and that does start with a communications issue. It's, it's just a question of getting the right communication so that, you know, small businesses with 14 people aren't sifting through huge amounts of data that they don't understand to try to find the thing that, the, you know, the Department of Defense really cares about and wants to invest in. Could I just follow up just briefly with you, Chris, on that? Like, what kind of communication from DOD would facilitate that purpose? You know, is it a... Is it a statement from the Secretary of the Navy or, you know, and obviously we have the national defense strategy and I won't yep. go into my rant about how our spending aligns with our strategy yep. at this panel, but, uh, cause I did that yesterday, but um, what, what would really like concretely be useful if you're gonna go to, you know, a venture capital round or, you know, what, yep. what would serve the purpose? So, you know, just briefly, I would say, you know, you mentioned the NDS and I think the NDS gets a lot of things right. The question is all of that work that has to happen downstream to translate an NDS into, you know, programmatic guidance and, uh, you know, technology investment guidance. I think there, there are things that the NDS says about new technologies that they think are important. Um, okay, let's define that in a higher level of granularity and have senior leaders express, you know, clearly that these are the, these are the things that they want to invest in. And frankly, I think it goes to the department as well. Um, those are the things that they should be programming for. Those are the things that should be getting increases of funding in, you know, the budgets that are being requested. Um, so in terms of, you know, the communication, I think it needs to be uh, pretty specific, um, which requires work. Um, and I think the communication needs to be pretty high level. You know, it needs to be senior leaders saying, these are my most urgent requirements. So I can actually respond. Um, then we'll get to Tara, but yeah, yes, go ahead. So just to respond to Chris's point, so two things that I would point you to in terms of official communication, and Ms. Lord has discussed this, um, former Secretary Mattis has discussed it. Um, in terms of the NDS with regards to, and I, I value your point previously around small companies and innovative companies, and the, re the reason that we want innovative small companies, not just checking the box, box that a company is small. Um, so in the NDS, so let me back up. We did an industrial-based assessment. In that industrial-based assessment, yes, there is a lot of information in the classified report, but there's a pretty robust pieces of information in the unclassified report. And in each of the 16 sectors that we looked at, everything from munitions and missiles to shipbuilding, ground combat systems, electronics, strategic and critical raw materials and workforce, there is a two to three page sector summary and we highlight the top three risk areas in each of those sectors where we have significant risk in the industrial base as it relates to the health of the industrial base. And I would welcome any company that looks at that report and says, I have a particular capability or capacity in that particular area and I can help the defense industrial base. I can help the Department of Defense because those are the areas that we're actually focused on. And that's where our office plays a role in terms of acquisition program decisions that may be happening at the service acquisition level on a program specific area, but we provide the strategic context of what does that acquisition mean from a long-term perspective and what are the implications going to be in the short, medium, and long-term with regards to how we support health of the industrial base. So critical energetics, semiconductors, printed circuit boards, all of these areas are places where we are making strategic investments, both from a high-level OSD perspective and through the services. The other area that we're working on, and this is not in our industrial waste assessment, and there was a strategic reason for that, is these next generation technologies. So the national defense strategy outlines the nine technology areas that research and engineering is focused on, like hypersonics, directed energy, AI, quantum science, et cetera. What we're working on and what is still yet, and I concur with your point, is still yet to be strongly communicated, but what I can tell you officially is that Acquisition and sustainment is working with research engineering and the services, as well as the innovation community, so our labs and DARPA, et cetera, to think about how does the Department of Defense become a customer in this space? So if you think about hypersonics and directed energy, I would hope that my neighbor doesn't have a hypersonics 
interest, and that the Department of Defense is going to be the primary consumer of that technology. So if DOD is the primary consumer of, our, of that technology, how do we become a better business partner to create consistent demand signals so that we build a healthy industrial base of small and medium and large companies that can withstand a long-term development and production cycle of those technologies? If you look at things like AI and quantum science, the Department of Defense most likely in those spaces, and Tara made this point, is going to be a niche customer of a much larger commercial market, but we will have very specific needs with regards to how do we utilize that technology in a war fighting capability. So how do we become a better customer in that space and protect the IP that we need to protect in a way that still allows these companies to be innovative so that they can leap ahead of our adversaries so on the battleground, we have the next generation technology that we need to withstand whatever the Chinese and the Russians are, are, with, are uh, developing. So that's where we're at, and I agree we need to have more concrete um, guidance in that space. But as we develop those industrial bases, we would welcome companies into the conversation around what does it mean from if I am an AI company and I want to compete commercially as well as in the defense space, what things are going to enable me to do that from the department, whether it's how, you, how we work together on intellectual property or development cycles, et cetera, and that's what we're working on now. Tara? Maybe I'll just pick up on that because, Brennan, you had a number of um, really helpful and interesting comments. One thing that strikes me is the framing around putting information out and um, looking to industry to sort of raise a hand and say, I can help here. And I think one of the things that makes this particular challenge that we're talking about um, both particularly difficult but also dynamic and interesting is the fact that we're seeing a major shift in responses of the industrial base. And instead of companies saying, absolutely, um, I'm interested in helping you know, the national security mission, I see a $700 billion plus budget and a big opportunity, Instead, I think you see a lot of companies saying, if I put my hand up, particularly publicly, I'm going to lose all of these employees or my recruiting efforts are going to tank. And instead, I Google, no matter what I'm actually doing in reality, I'm going to put out a big public statement saying, no, I'm not working with the Department of Defense anymore on AI programs. And Microsoft writing an open letter from employee, publishing an open letter from a number of employees saying, please don't work with DOD. This shift in, um, in sort of participation and willing, willingness to opt in is not one that is solely relegated to small businesses who are trying to break, break in and might be uh, disinclined to, but is also happening on a larger scale. So um, I'm sure that's top of mind for both of you and your colleagues, and I think uh, it makes the problem particularly hard. I just wanted to come back um, to what we were talking about before about data and information sharing environment and say that um, primes, of course, aren't incentivized to share any information about their suppliers or their subcontractors. And I think that I think that the private sector and the, and the think tank community will put brilliant researchers against the problem and figure out how to deal with the data. What I worry about is I worry about government's ability to solve the data problem. Um, and there, it's the government, it's the national security enterprise who needs that data the most from primes. The department should never be at a data disadvantage to industry. They are owners of the mission and should always have the information that they need in order to execute that mission with the right teams and the right partners and the right private sector involvement. And I think that, I think that DOD in particular, given its size and scale, needs to solve that data problem in order to get that advantage back so that we start thinking about bringing innovative companies into not just quantum and AI, but also into shipbuilding and missiles um, and improve the environment there. Um, one thing that I would be interested in knowing about is 
how is subcontracting leading to prime contracting opportunities? Because mm -hmm. as a small business professional, one of the things that we talk about with our uh, government um, acquisition workforce is that we really need to focus not just on, you so see the focus is a lot on, on prime contracting because that's where the goal is, right? So everyone's focused on getting small businesses to be prime contractors, but um, and that's where sometimes a goal can maybe drive the wrong behavior because I think we ought to also focus on subcontracting because that's a way that smalls get their foot in the door and it'd be interesting to see a study on subcontracting and how those opportunities impact the prime contracting opportunities and whether companies stay in or stay out. Um, so I think that I think one of your questions that you had sent to us in advance was about subcontracting. I think that we need to focus on subcontracting a little bit more and pay attention to that, not just to meet a goal, but to be providing these companies opportunities to um, participate in, in the defense marketplace and contribute in a lot of the innovative companies, and not just relying on the prime contractors to be finding these innovative companies. Um, that's one comment. Another comment I would have is um, I think that we, we do have a lot of tools in the toolbox that we can use that I think that we could maybe use better. Like um, I think that we can focus a little bit better on how we use the Small Business Innovative Innovation Research Program and make sure that we are getting to the right companies, um, the right kinds of companies, and not just getting to companies that are really good at writing a proposal for a phase one and phase two and then don't maybe have an, ins you know, don't really want to go to phase three. I, I've heard that there's a lot of good companies out there that can write those proposals, but they may not be the innovative companies. So are we, you know, using that program to our advantage? And then also using the Mentor Protege program, which had a lapse in 2019, but I think Congress is looking at reauthorizing that in, in 2020. I think the Mentor Protege program we could use more strategically to target areas where we have a weak industrial base or where we're one deep to, you know, incentivize companies to try to create some um, large businesses to create some competition and maybe mentor a small business and helping that company scale and grow. And look, using the Mentor Protege pr program to help companies that are in the SBIR program transition their technology. I think that we can use those programs, um, you know, more strategically than just kind of, you know, having them out there and, you know, thinking of the SBIR program as a tax. I think we could think of it as something that we could use um, that's advantageous to us in terms of um, bringing in non-traditional companies. And then one other thing is just communication. Sometimes it's just the basic communication. I mean, I think, uh, like you said, Chris, they know how to find us, but sometimes the big, the, where I spend a lot of my time is companies that don't know how to find us. They don't even know who to talk to. They don't even know where to start. And um, so that's overwhelming to them. And one of the things, we have another Facebook Live session coming up where I'll be talking with Mr. Branch. And we're, we've had a lot of different meetings with small businesses, so we understand some of the challenges that they have in doing business with the Department of the Navy. And we're doing things about it, but we're not communicating what we're doing. We're not communicating as well as we could as to how we are trying to reduce those cycle times and you know what we're, we're, we're doing internally to address a lot of the barriers that small businesses bring to our attention. And I think it's February 19th where I'll be having a Facebook Live discussion with him, trying to get that word out. And I know not everyone wants to be on Facebook, but that's you know, one of the areas where you can have a live you know, video. But what we do then is we post that video on our YouTube channel and then provide a link to it on LinkedIn. So we're really, you know, I think one of the things that we could do is think about how we can use technology to reach a broader audience and to reach the right audience. Instead of having industry day, you know, in Norfolk and only the companies in Norfolk that heard about it are there, you know, we've got, we've got to make sure that we're reaching a broader group of industry, including the non-traditionals that aren't looking at FBO or may not really want to do business with us. And part of their not wanting to do business with us might be just rumors they've heard. So we've got to go knock down those rumors and show them that we are really trying to reduce barriers and that we do really want to work with them and that it is important for our nation's defense that they work with us and we work with them. Chris, do you? Yeah, just briefly. Um, yes. I guess let me underscore. I mean, the last point I made was about communications. I ultimately don't think this is fundamentally a communications problem. Like, I think ultimately this is about this is an investment problem. This is about a willingness to make larger bets on small companies. Um, to say, look, just because you're a 50-person company that's existed for 18 months 
doesn't mean that I can't give you a $150 million contract or a billion dollar contract. What is the value that you are providing to me? Um, and if you look at it that way, um, I, I think that's the kind of thing that people will then start to take notice. Then they'll start to say, the department's been saying the right things for a while. Now they're actually starting to move the needle. Now you're starting to see your neighbor who may not you know, want to buy hypersonics but might want to build them uh, say, I'm going to go live my dream of becoming you know, a new entrant to the defense sector and stop making ad optimization software and instead make you know, artificial intelligence to the United States military. That's, I think, how you really start to realign incentives. I so, agree. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. To me, I think that's the bigger thing that we need to pay attention to to know whether this is really changing or not. Mm -hmm. And then when we do have those success stories where we're awarding a big amount of money to a small business and that's successful, communicating that mm -hmm. so that more people see that we're investing. Yeah, good point. I'm going to take a stab at this subcontract issue. It's kind of kind of a rant of mine. Can we talk about subcontract data? But, um, you know, one of my concerns is that Congress put in a mandate and said we want the sub subcontract data to be collected in a fashion similar to what we have for prime contracts. Um, but of course, the holders of that data are the primes, not the department. And so the mandate then falls on the primes to put the data in the database. And I always find it fun when I'm having, you know, we do a study and we go to the primes and I say, well, did you look at subcontract data? And we said, yes, and it's useless. And then we, every, we all bemoan the fact that we wish we had this data. But of course, it's the primes who put the data in the database. Now, having said that, to be fair to them, you know, there are exceptions to, to what they're required to put in, and those exceptions, I think, at some level of principle don't seem insane, but the result is insane. The result is that we have, you know, roughly 15 to 20 percent of all prime contract dollars are captured in the subcontract database. The percent has actually been declining over time, at least through the years that we've looked at. Uh, the, the most latest years, we're still looking for data, and so we're actually getting worse at our visibility into the subcontract data rather than better. So whatever it is about the exceptions that we've drawn for industry or our implementation of the requirement, it's getting worse, not better. Um, and, and so, uh, Brennan, I think, or no, maybe it was Tara, you talked about the, the lack of incentives for the primes to really share any information that they're not absolutely positively required to share uh, about their supply chain. And of course, there are security issues there, so that's not not entirely unreasonable. There's obviously big business incentives. Are there incentives we could give to industry that would make this work, that would actually make us gather the, sm the subcontract data that we need that's useful to have, that doesn't give away you know, critical national security information? Yeah. Um, so uh, here, here, <laughs> um, first of all. so. One of the major findings of our assessment was that we don't have visibility into the supply chain. Um, so I work a lot with the primes and they are good people and, and their intentions are well thought out. Um, but we had conversations with them over the course of doing this industrial based assessment and they said, we can tell you down to tier five, we can tell you the raw material, where we source it from, where it's coming from. Um, and everything about our supply chain. And we did the assessment with the data that we had within the federal government. And it was, not, it was led by the DOD, but for, uh, just for clarification, it was an all of government approach. So Department of Commerce actually collects a lot of data uh, through legal means, surveys, et cetera, that they do. And we had a lot of that data as well, um, Department of Labor, um, et cetera. The findings that we had on things down to the raw material space through the entire life cycle of major weapons platforms were in more than a few cases surprising to the primes. Um, so we've had classified discussions with them about the risks in their industrial base and told them what, where they're sourcing raw material from, where they're sourcing different components from, companies that are struggling financially in their space, and oftentimes the response was we were not aware of that. So to Tara's point, I do think that part of the impetus is where the data lies. The federal government at the end of the day is the primary customer of all of these platforms and systems, has the onus on it to ensure the industrial base strategically is healthy in order to support those, um, those activities. Uh, but what there is a cost to gathering all of that data. 
there is a resource requirement to gathering all of that data. So what we're working with industry now on is now that we've demonstrated to you we need to have better visibility and we need your help in order to achieve that better visibility, what is it going to cost? Because the cost eventually is going to come back to the government and that's going to come back to the taxpayer. So how do we do that in a way that is actually beneficial and valuable for all parties involved? Do we do it for all of our pr programs and platforms? Do we just do it for those that we deem critical? Do we do it for our major defense acquisition programs, our MDAP programs? Um, and then how do we create those processes and practices as we move forward in these other, in these next generation technology spaces to determine what data we need and how we look at it? So we do have a challenge there with the subcontracting data because oftentimes we can get to tier two approximately, so prime tier one, tier two, um, but below that is where we actually see most of the risk, down to you know the tier seven supplier who procures the raw material. We have an example of a tier five supplier that went bankrupt and the government didn't find out until two years later and we had to stand up a source for that component because it was critical on most of our munitions and missiles which in case you're wondering, you need a lot of um, in any time. Uh, so we're looking at how do we increase that visibility. And then there's the whole conversation around where is the data housed, how is it protected, how do we ensure that it doesn't get into the right hands, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a challenge. Thanks. I mean, I'll just respond to that. So. Um, this is going to sound self-serving because this is what my company does, but let me just say the data already exists. And so I hope no matter who DOD and the rest of the government go to um, when they do take on this issue of, okay, we need a complete picture, we need to regain the data advantage. I, I talk about this all the time. I truly hope that uh, de the department takes the lessons that it's learned from IT in the software context and goes to what exists today. There are existing data sets that have, that have pulled a complete picture um, which cannot be done through one single source, um, but literally there are companies whose business this is, um, or at least there's one of them. Um, and, and the point is I think there's something about leveraging commercial technology that incentivizes everything that we're talking about today, which is a move toward innovation, toward working with companies that want to be a part of this market but might have um, incentives otherwise stacked against it. Um, and then the other thing I, I would say is uh, the partners within DOD that we are working with on supply chain issues, exactly what we're doing with this data is we're arming them with insight so that they can go and talk to the primes mm -hmm. and we find exactly the same thing, that it's um, despite how, you know, all, I think all large organizations fundamentally struggle with the same data management challenges. And so while they might be sitting on the data and have it, they aren't necessarily getting the insights from it themselves. And being able to foster that conversation of, do you know what exists here, um, is exactly what we're finding as well on, on our end. So I would, I would, so I, agree with you. So the data does exist. Where the challenge is, is that there's a lack of visibility and transparency into how the data, as you look down through an acquisition program, actually um, can be utilized across the industrial base. So what we're working on is how do you collect all of that data, whether it's from public sources like Thompson Reuters and Dun & Bradstreet on actual contracting data, to what the companies are actually producing, so what their capabilities and capacity are, and then how do you map that across the entire industrial base to look at capacity and capability from a holistic perspective. So concur, and it's kind of the next generation of how do we do that supply chain mapping. And I know there are a lot of companies, I've talked to a lot of them, uh, it's often interesting to see kind of how we're trying to approach it versus how their thoughts around it are. So yeah, it's an evolving topic. Before I go to audience questions, I want to throw one last curveball at you. Um, and uh, I want to kind of flip the mirror around, right? So we spent most of the discussion talking about the failures of the DOD in accessing you know, innovative 
uh, new small companies. We, we talked briefly in the green room beforehand about the fact that this is a very unique study for CSIS because we do these studies of the defense industrial base and before you even do the study you can kind of draw out the shape of the curve of most other graphs. And so depending on what issue you're looking at, you're going to see that things get really weird in 2008, 2009 because of the financial crisis and the, the business cycle crash. You're going to predict that everything gets really terrible in 2013 when sequestration was triggered. Uh, and, and you're also going to see that different sectors of industry do really different things. And aviation has a profile, land vehicles has a profile, it's very grim. Uh, other sectors have different profiles. But with this data, with this new entrant data, much to our shock, it has that, almost that same shape of a sharply downsloping line, no matter how you slice and dice the data, or at least how we've thought to slice and dice it traditionally. And it, it also brings to mind that there's quite a bit of work that's been done on the broader US economy that shows that, in fact, entrepreneurship has declined and that there are fewer new businesses in general across the entire economy. So in that respect, our data is maybe a little unsurprising because it, it may be reflecting broader trends. So is there a, an extent to which the problem that we're having you, from, from what you've seen is actually exterior to DOD uh, and it is something that is being driven by broader trends and not defense trends. So I'll throw that out there. I'm not saying it's true, but I, I would ask folks if they want to either support or rebut that idea. I, I, I guess to me, you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I, I do think the, the story ultimately starts with the customer. Um, you know, I think that if you're trying to figure out why, you know, you have this remarkable consistency, right? I mean, you guys controlled for all variables and the story was the exact same. Like, to me, that suggests that the problem is probably not in the private sector. It probably starts somewhere else. And, and I guess the main point that I would make is if in this period of time, you're coming out of college as a software engineer or you're an investor looking for, you know, the next bet that is gonna become a billion dollar company, um, why in the world would you do, why would you join the defense world? You know, all of the economic incentives say, go make cat facial recognition software in Silicon Valley. Go bet on FinTech or biotech. Um, since the end of the Cold War, there's been two companies that have started up to work in national security that have become billion dollar companies. Um, where there are dozens in other sectors. Um, at the end of the day, I think this is a problem ultimately with the customer. It could be a communications problem, it could be an investment problem, um, but I think it could be a funding problem, an instability of funding problem. But to me, I think that's where the problem lies. And look, I mean, that's the world I came from. And, you know, I, putting the blame back on myself in my former life, um, you know, I, I think that is largely where the, where the problem originates. Yeah, and I would just say, so prior to coming to this job, I ran a research and development program, and um, our customers were the entire federal government, primarily DOD, but it wasn't the majority. Um, and so think of NASA and GSA and uh, Department of Interior, et cetera. And overwhelmingly, the challenge with getting the R&D projects that we were working on into some sort of contracting mechanism with the government would take years. And there was a significant investment made by the organization to work on some projects, but over you know the number of years that I was running the program, I think we only had a handful of projects that actually went into long-term contracts. So I, I would sort of echo Chris's point. I think at the end of the day, the innovative aspect of how the government attempts to do business with companies that want to be innovative and agile, we just have to do better. We have to be a better business customer. We have to be a better business partner. Um, because it's, you know, do, we've talked a lot about the Department of Defense. I recognize that's where I come from. But my experience has been broader than that, and it has been a government endemic issue for a long time, so. All right, I'll open up at this point to audience questions. So, in the back. Uh, they're gonna bring a microphone over to you. <laughs> well, but we do have an online audience, so there you go. 
Hi, how are you? Vaga Maradian from Defense and Aerospace Report. Uh, fantastic uh, panel. Um, Chris, you're 100% right, right? I mean, if you wanted to actually innovate, you would look at Andrew and say, okay, if you have a problem you can solve, let's get you that contract, and then it serves as an inspiration to others. I mean, remember, Textron spent hundreds of millions of its own dollars to develop an airplane that the Pentagon's not yet bought. Doesn't send a particularly good signal to the rest of the ecosystem that that's the kind of investment you guys want to make, uh, potentially. And the question is, how do you change the model, right? I mean, everybody in this model has monetized time at one point or another. Um, that's the reason why the things that we have are the things that we continue to doing with incremental improvement. Um, a lot of the things that everybody talks about is the government being a better customer, whereas in some of these cases, let's just be honest, the government has to like more openly subsidize stuff. It's not about being a customer, it's about maintaining capability even at the expense of a cost that historically we haven't wanted to do because we think mythically the private sector will do this. What is the ecosystem change that has to happen when you're in a great power competition and you're no longer in the position that you imagined yourself to be and you may have to think fast, act fast, and actually break some of the paradigms in which we have invested quite a lot of money, time, um, and effort, even though the people in that ecosystem will not want that ecosystem changed. I'm not trying to be negative, but you know, if, if you make a certain product and have made it for 40 years, you want to keep making it for another 40 years, whether or not that product today may, may, have, may have passed. How do, we, how do we change that dynamic to allow the innovative guy, I mean, honestly, in the commercial industry, if Apple doesn't make a good phone, Apple is going to get its butt kicked by other phone makers. And that's not necessarily the case in the defense ecosystem. I will, I'm actually going to harken back to your prior life. Right. So, um, one of the, there's two things, and I think Tara made this point. There is a number of legislative reforms, and actually the largest since Goldwater Nichols that were passed between the FY17, sorry, 16, 17, and 18 NDAA about doing acquisition more rapidly and effectively and efficiently. And we are working on, and I appreciated the point of around, we don't necessarily need more legislation, we just need time to enact the legislation that we already have. And so that's a lot of the acquisition reform efforts that we're doing now within the department. Um, I, th I think that there's a balance between the way that the department procures things and the way we fight wars and the way we sustain national security and the programs that we have have very long-term sustainment life cycles. So the two-ship buy that the Navy just signed with Huntington Ingalls, we're looking at sustaining an industrial base for two aircraft carriers for many, many decades. But there is also the balance of how do we create, to how do we continue to innovate where you look at we haven't really fielded a major, a new a newly integrated major missile system in decades, so we're actually seeding a lot of the innovation in that space, both from a company perspective as well as a human capital perspective. Um, so how do you balance against the fact that we still have to have the ability to sustain these platforms and systems because if the balloon goes up, which at the end of the day our job is to make sure that it never happens, but if we do go to war, we have to be able to utilize those platforms. But then how do we also develop the technology for next generation war fight because the next war is going to look different than OIF and OEF. And to your point, Vago, around in the commercial space, Apple, if they're not doing well, they'll get their butts kicked by a competitor. We're getting our butts kicked by China. So we're getting our butts kicked by China. It's not exactly the same in terms of how we look at the commercial technology where you look at revenue generation, et cetera, but when you look at how we're we need to be better in terms of how we develop technology and look at our adversaries and the investments that they are making both in the human capital as well as in the capability development of these next generation technologies and what the department needs to do in order to ensure that we have the development of those technologies and that we're leading edge instead of fast following in that space, then we are already in that situation. So we have to do things more productively and effectively in that space. And I would say I think that we are. I mean, I feel a sense of urgency when I go to different meetings and see, you know, that hear the discussion. I hear a mm -hmm. sense of urgency, and I yeah. hear change. Um, we're a big organization, so it's hard to communicate that all the way across. But I think that we're looking at how we teach our acquisition workforce. We're looking at making some changes in the um, Defense Acquisition University and the courses, how we train, how we teach, how we communicate. It's not going to happen uh, instantaneously, but I do see. Um, a big focus on all of those things. Just two brief points. Sorry, not projecting. Um, 
I think ultimately, you know, the bad news is what we're talking about. The good news, I think, is like we have seen the problem and it is us, um, which suggests to me that we're capable of changing. Mm -hmm. To me, the most significant metric that I would look at is how much time are senior leaders in the Department of Defense who are ultimately accountable for fixing the problem that Brennan mentioned, which is that we're getting beaten right now, how much of their time are they devoting to figuring out what are the operational capabilities that we're going to need to get ahead? Mm -hmm. um, and how much time are they figuring out and learning where to put down big investments for the future? And the second point I'd make is when we think about how to make those investments, I think we need to think differently about it. We need to think about betting on people. Um, that's what we've done successfully when we've been successful in the past. Um, when the nation said, I want to put a nuclear weapon on the other side of the planet in a matter of minutes, you know, we invested in Benny Shriver. We gave him a lot of money and a lot of runway and a lot of flexibility, and he did it in five years. Um, a lot of people probably walked in and said, hey, you know, I want to go to Mars. Um, Elon Musk got the check because of people just sort of said, like, that guy's going to go to Mars. Like, I don't know what it is about him, but my guess is he'll probably get there. Like, we need to go find those people who are doing this kind of work and put bets on them. Um, that's what we've done when we've been successful in the past. Admiral Rickover uh, in the Navy. Um, that's what industry does every day. That's what the investment community does every day. We need to pick winners. Um, and I think the metric that I would pay attention to is how much time are senior leaders who own this problem uh, finding and, and actually putting bets on winners. Mm -hmm. And look, nine out of 10 are probably gonna turn out to be not winners, but the one that turns out to be a winner is gonna change everything. And that to me is the metric that, that I would be paying attention to. And if I were in my last life, I would certainly be trying to encourage from the Capitol Hill perspective. Can I tag on as well? Because I think there has to be one, one more step, which is at the end of all of that, did it work? So how, going back to earlier points that others made and something I said as well, we have to measure whether we're being successful with these plans and, and what we set out to do. So if the FY20 budget is, is the masterpiece, who is owning, breaking down what all the expense looks like on the other side to find out if everything that was laid out in the NDS is actually funded. Mm -hmm. And I, I worry a lot about what the results of that are because I fear that we are playing on the margins in terms of changes that we're making and tweaks from an investment perspective. And in the, a time of great power competition that we're in right now, it has to be more than marginal change. But if we don't look at the full line rather than the stovepipe process of PPBE, if we don't turn that into a feedback cycle where an evaluation of execution dollars against strategic priorities and programming and then budgeting, um, without that, I don't think that we will get to what you raised, sir. Well, I, I'm willing to, very briefly though, I mean, I, I, I understand uh, what everybody is saying, but does this mean we're laying the, because, I'm sorry, I've been listening to this now for 25 years of almost the 30 years I've been doing, you know, the whole time I've been doing this, it's right around the corner. Are we laying the foundation to see very rapid change coming in the next couple of years? Is, is that what we're saying? Because I think everybody keeps saying like, well, we have to make different bets. We have to, I, I understand. I mean, nobody ever goes to work at the Pentagon saying I want to do a crappy job, right? I mean, we've been working on advancing this ball for a long time. Are we on step? Are we on the cusp to seeing sort of streaking changes in the next year or so? Are we building that foundation? So um, I, I feel very optimistic, but I'm also a realist in this space. Um, but I would say that in my time working on the periphery and now and, and over my time over the last two administrations in this, this space, I would say, yes, we're on the cusp of something. I would just caveat this, that with the fact that rapid, in the sense of how Webster's Dictionary defines the word of rapid and how we all think of rapid, um, when you think of an organization that is the 15th largest economy in the world and has three million people in it, and then all of the organizations and the companies that support it, it is a very large organization. And just from a change perspective, large organizations take a little longer to make, make changes. So I would just say rapid in the sense that yes, Currently, I have never been more encouraged by how we're thinking differently about the way that the Department of Defense does business, but 
we are a massive organization and change management 101 is oftentimes there's a direct correlation between size of an organization and how quickly it can change. Let's come here. My question is for Ms. Harmon and Mr. Bros. Ms. Harmon, you mentioned the SBIR as a potential vehicle. Uh, the GAO recently put out a report saying that less than 3% of SBIR funds went to majority-owned venture capital fund businesses. And it sort of stands to reason that these would be the types of businesses that you would expect are probably the most innovative. Like they've convinced investors that, hey, we're doing something most likely useful be able to sell this, like potentially be this unicorn as the, you know, that place calls it. And it's, it's less that they're not being awarded to it, it's that the DOD or whoever else, they're not applying, like they're not applying for these SBR grants. The VC owned businesses for the $500,000 million SBR grants as opposed to the 20 million they can get in a round of investing funding. So for both of you, uh, is, is this an acceptable, like a revampable system for the SBIR or is there a potential better way to go about saying, hey, maybe we can throw some more money, maybe we can streamline this process for you a little better in order to attract some of these more innovative companies? Um, I would say that within the Department of the Navy, we're taking another look at our SBIR pro our program to. Um, look at ways to make it more effective, and that's pretty much all I can say right now, but it is a discussion within the Department of the Navy, so you might see some information coming out about that. But, um, you know, it's definitely a program that I think that we can take more advantage of and um, recognize that, you know, it's small amounts of money in the beginning, so some companies may not want to um, participate in that. So just let you know that it's something that we're looking at. Briefly, um, I think SBIR needs to be completely rethought. I mean, if I were still on the Hill, man, that would be a high priority of mine. Um, it's a huge opportunity, right? I mean, basically we're saying like, thou shalt spend a not insignificant amount of your money right. on innovation. Um, but then you look to your point at what is actually being done with that money and it makes you wanna cry. I think you need to think about SBIR, and this is probably something that can be done with no change whatsoever in terms of, you know, again, betting on different things, betting on different companies, giving them larger bets. And then to the, to the, the most important point um, is they have to go somewhere. I mean, SBIR can't be a cul-de-sac where you can get $500,000 little grants to you know, nibble around the edges for forever. You know, it needs to, it needs to transition into something significant, you know. So I'd say larger amounts of money on fewer numbers of things. And when you get those things that really pan out, man, there's got to be a huge upside on the, on the back end of SBIR so that those small companies can become big companies and vital parts of the industrial base. Right. I think, I think um, sometimes we, you know, folks might just look at SBIR as a tax. So, you know, the programs with R&D money are taxed a certain percent, and that has to go to SBIR. So some, um, acquisition, some members of the acquisition workforce are better than others at taking advantage of that. You know, some just look at it, oh, it's a tax, and, you know, may not get anything out of it. Others really, you know, try to make sure that they get something out of it. But it is something that we're looking at as, a, as another tool in our toolbox that probably doesn't take uh, any more changes. It's just that we can use it more efficiently that within the authorities that we already have. And we're definitely looking at that and making sure that the topics that we pick are aligned with um, where we need to go with the national defense strategy within the Navy and the Marine Corps. All right, with the forbearance of the audience, I think we had one last hand here. Uh, I'll try and fit that one in. If you can make it quick, just uh, quick as you can. Sure, thanks. Uh, good morning, Oliver Fryer with uh, the Boone Group as a research fellow. Uh, my question pertains to those small companies or firms who have been awarded contracts, who perform well, who make it to that stage of graduation, and they're kind of trying to make it into the middle category, the middle tier. How do we incentivize either through policy procedure, acknowledge we talked about investments, but how do we uh, kind of help them broaden their offering and stay in that category? Um, so we actually have a couple of different programs. Some are run out of our office. Um, so we have the Defense Production Act Title III, and we have the Industrial Based Analysis and Sustainment Program. 
And then the Manufacturing Technology Program, which used to be in our office and now is in Research and Engineering as part of the reorganization. And so those are programs that are looking at how do you help build capacity and capability within the industrial base and typically focus on small and medium-sized companies. So they don't have the requirements of having, of being a small business as defined by SB, uh, Small Business Administration. I'm trying not to use acronyms. Um, but they have the ability to say if there is a company that is providing a unique capability that's gone beyond the technology readiness levels of three or four, so they're actually in production and they're moving towards commercialization, if those companies have an opportunity and there's a demonstrated need from the services to say we absolutely find this to be a valuable aspect of this particular platform or this program or this industrial capability, but they need help with a capital equipment investment or a facility equipment investment or workforce development and training, they can tap into those programs and we can provide some funding. Um, and oftentimes it's a cost sharing type arrangement to help them get to the next level so that they have those capabilities and capacity. And so we look at those types of programs to help leverage the ability of the government to support those companies that are moving from the small into the medium, into the medium zone to help them be more competitive. Um, so that's just one example of, of some of the things that we do in that space. All right, well, I think it's gonna close us out. So uh, I really wanna thank our audience for braving the, the weather and joining us today. It's a pretty good crowd, actually. And thank our online audience as well. And I really wanna thank our our panel for an excellent discussion of this issue. Please do find the report, it's online. There's, I think, some more hard copies perhaps as you exit if you didn't get one on the way in. And please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.